Welcome, everyone. Um, Dell and I are, are glad to present this afternoon for most of us on behalf of Zahn and Zahn Academy. And today's the second part of our two-part series on business process. So those of you who attended the first one will build on that and use Trusana as a case study for business process. For those of you that missed it, you'll be fine because we'll go back through the basic principles as we move forward. So let's get started. Um, a little bit about myself is I'm with Weiss Advisors. I founded it about three years ago. I work with pretty much dental labs exclusively to help them generate more free time, increase their income, and, and really just remove stress from their life. I'm married. I have three grown children and six grandkids. And I like the, because of the amount of travel I do, I, I enjoy seeing the country and visiting microbreweries or wineries wherever I go. And happens to be how I met Dell, and I'll let him introduce himself. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dell Dine. I've uh, been in the dental laboratory industry my entire working life. Um, I've owned laboratories, managed laboratories, uh, primarily for National Dentex. Uh, I span a 30-year career with them. And I uh, essentially ended up uh, with National Dentex as the um, VP of um, Research and Development, um, and then retired. And then uh, I've been working with uh, Larry for the past almost two years, uh, kind of helping him do what he do, which is hopefully we're uh, improving your work life and uh, you know positioning your laboratory uh, so you can get the uh, the greatest multiple uh, if you would decide when you decide to sell it. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Dell. So today's program, here's an outline of what we want to accomplish. We'll start, we've done the introductions. We're going to talk about as we go into the case study, uh, we'll talk a little bit about a tool called SWAT which is a very powerful tool to help laboratories improve goals and objectives, planning and then execution. Uh, today's meant to be as interactive as a webinar can be. So you have a Q and A, you have a Q and A icon there on your screen. You have any questions anywhere along the line, feel free to type, type anything you want in there and we'll either respond to it right away Fran will bring those to our attention, or we'll cover them at the end of the program. So with this, uh, Fran, if we could do our first polling question, uh, do you have a 3D printer in your laboratory? And that's just yes or no. And the, the responses will show up here anonymous, and we'll see what percentage of laboratories have printers. So check your box and we'll come back to that as we go through here, as we move on to the next slide. So as I had mentioned, today we're gonna to explore the questions that Dell and I would encourage you to ask as you consider adding a new product or a new process to your laboratory. First, we'll look at why would you want to add a product or a process, and what are the benefits of changing? And I'll refer to those as our high-level strategies, that we want to make sure our plans capitalize on our strengths and that we can execute on our plans. Del, anything you'd like to add there? No, I would just kind of say that we're going to be uh, using the uh, uh, Trisana kind of as, as our new product. So that kind of keep in mind as you put these together, because it is interactive and you're going to need to you know, kind of be working on this a little bit um, is kind of think in terms of uh, just being able to uh, uh, add Trisana as that product. So Beth, would you, would you close out that first polling question and what were the, what did we come up with responses? There we go. So as you can see, Larry, we have 80% uh, of people have 
3D printers, and we have 20% who is thinking about investing. Okay, excellent. That's pretty good. That is really good. Dell, since I'm running the program for my end, I'm not seeing those slide presentations or the responses. So I'll look to you to respond. I'll look to you to uh, kind of respond to those for me, for us, okay? Uh, okay. So let's, if you would put up another polling question here, um, Fran, is who has introduced a new product in the last 12 months? We'll give Fran a second to get that put up. There you go, Larry. It's up and people are answering. Excellent. So, so far it's, it's pretty much 50-50. 40% say yes, 40% say no so far, and 20% are thinking about it. Okay. What's interesting is when we talk about a new product and I add process in there is, Really, anything we can, we we make decisions as lab owners and managers to introduce products for the benefit of our customers, sometimes for the benefit of the customers and for our laboratory, and sometimes purely for the benefit of the laboratory. And each of those you approach, or at least I approach differently as as I manage Keller Dental Lab but the process that we would go through would be pretty similar. And one of the things that we did as we started that was we'd always do a SWOT analysis. And Beth, if you would, or uh, Fran, if you would here, could we put up the polling question on who is used to SWOT analysis? There you go, Larry. It's up and let's see who's going to answer. So, so far, 100% uh, are saying no, they have not. Well, that's good. And, and I think that's part of the value of this. The part of the value of what we want to accomplish today is this is this is the point where I'd ask each of you to take out a blank piece of paper and let's make some notes here. And Dell, feel free to jump in here anytime too, is SWAT stands for strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities. And what I really like about this tool is our ability to really look at almost any opportunity or any problem from this perspective. So when we think of strengths, what do you do better than your competitors? And I wouldn't put pickup and delivery or our qualities higher. You wanna be specific and measurable here. And one of my favorite questions here is, why do your customers use you? Dell, I know you've got some thoughts on strengths too. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I really suggest that you uh, kind of reach out to some of your customers um, and you know, kind of pose that question to them. Because uh, we've all got, uh, you know, a handful of customers that are really pretty good communicators and we have got a good relationship with. But I think getting the customer's insight um, is really valuable here because uh, I don't know, I sort of felt like when I was managing a laboratory, I spent too much time sort of speculating what the customer was thinking as opposed to actually just getting right there and, you know, face to face with them. A couple of things I like to do here, too, is we'd always reach out to a couple customers who had left us because oh, yeah. we didn't just want feedback from those who loved us. We wanted to know why other folks left us. And generally, and you know who you can call and who you can't, but their feedback was generally pretty honest. And I think those can be as valuable or more valuable than your existing customers. And Another thing that we would do here is at different times, we, we had a group of individuals that were on the phone with customers and the same thing happens internally with employees. We kept what we call a no record or a no report. And what I wanted to know is we'd meet, we'd meet once a month or periodically 
with customer facing team and then the sort of the employee facing team. And I just want you to write down every time you tell somebody no. And it was interesting because every now and then something would surface that a customer would ask for something. And the one instance, the brand new gal was answering the phone and she was about two weeks in and she had her list, she had her list there. And I said, okay, so what have you said no to the most? And it had a question to do with pickup and delivery. And if we were past an office and she had told six customers in the last two weeks, we couldn't come get their case. And I looked at her and I said, well, why did you do that? And she said, well, when I started, the person who I took this, that moved on and I did their job, they said, George Keller said, we don't do that. And I kind of smiled at her and I said, do you know who George Keller is? And she goes, no, I never met the man. And I said, that's because he, re he retired 12 years ago. So we, we, had, we had a policy that unofficially had gotten created and passed from employee to employee. And you know what? That wasn't really what we were thinking nowadays. We, we wanted to really be a little more customer centric and take a look at that. Let's talk a little bit about weaknesses. What do you not do as well as your competition? This one, you wanna be specific and you wanna be honest. As Dell had pointed out, ask your clients. I mean, ask the doctors what they have to say. Dell, some thoughts? Yeah, just on the uh, uh, weakness side of it, you know, again, kind of back to, we sort of speculate what the dentist is thinking. We did a, um, we uh, took uh, several of the uh, lost opportunities, we called it, which was they came in, they tried us, but they didn't stay with us. Um, and, you know, kind of the first thing you tend to go to as a, a, a lab guy is, uh, oh, well, they, you know, the, we must have failed on the quality. Um, but we found a good percentage of them that said, no, no, the quality is fine. But when we asked them why they didn't stay, they simply said, well, it's just, you know, we got a habit of sending to the other laboratory. You know, they've got their processes uh, in the office and then they would, uh, you know, just kind of had their boxes and their scripts and, you know, their routine. And then so with a new product, you know, you really have to kind of drive home and, and work, uh, continue, you know, can follow that up. Uh, if you're getting new product to keep them reminded that, you know, they wanted you know, to get them to change to you so that they don't fall back into old habits of sending to their laboratory. Yeah, and I think this is where that honest look and getting feedback from your team and from your customers. One of the things as we work with laboratories, especially smaller laboratories, often there's just one person that knows how to do something. So whether it's a, a oh, yeah. complicated implant case or a specific platform, what we realize is, well, when Dell's on vacation, we really can't handle those calls. And to me, those are, those are weaknesses that if Dell's out sick or Dell's on vacation, does that mean 48 weeks of the year we're really good at this and four weeks we're really bad? <laughs> and just something to think about. And that kind of leads us to threats. And what are the threats to your business? And these can be a lot of things. I mean, it's something I hadn't thought about prior to March of 2020, but obviously COVID was a giant threat to us. And thought had never entered my mind, what do we do with the pandemic? Uh, other, th other threats are we had a period at Keller where there was a lot of construction going on and suddenly we were losing power about every other day, which in the old days was a pain because you couldn't do anything. In the current times with digital manufacturing, it meant our um, centering ovens all rebooted, which is about the worst thing you can do to zirconia as you're trying to center it. So think about what those threats are. Who, what could cause you pain in your business or what could negatively affect your business? Del? 
Yeah, you know, the, one of the things I hadn't occurred to me, but I was talking to a couple of different laboratories who, you know, were saying that just the supply chain uh, was a threat to them. You know, they were having, you know, hard time getting materials on time. So when you think about a new product, you know, you want to look into it and just make sure, you know, what the lead time is to get your uh, supplies in, uh, things like that. You know, there's, um, you know, there's kind of threats all around us. We just have to think about it because they're not always readily apparent. And then the last piece here where we do the analysis is on opportunities. Um, on the one, one side, I like to look at why do we get new customers? Where do they come from? And could I do more of those things? And I think nowadays for a lot of us with the labor shortages we're having to deal with, you know what, the opportunity to move analog processes that tend to be slow or dirty or harder to train to digital is a real advantage. Because as we work with laboratories across the country, that's the one lever we see being pulled all of the time. That, you know what, I can't find people, so I need to find things that allow my, my people that are here to be more productive. And as a result, you know what, I can handle another couple of clients, or I could do a few more cases every day because I've replaced these old analog steps with digital steps that in many cases are easier to train. Del, anything you want to add there? Yeah, Larry, I just have to underscore that, you know, the the idea of moving things to a digital process sort of helps you uh, leverage the skill sets you have in the laboratory as that almost universally that people are having difficulty uh, filling um, you know, uh, a need with skilled labor. Um, you know, they're retiring and just not coming back, you know. Yeah, exactly. So what with this exercise, I think it's important to come up with three to five entries in each area. And you record these here. And when you go through it with your team or with customers, don't, there really are no bad ideas or bad comments. You just want to gather them. And then once you have them all gathered, then we'll move on to the exercise where let's pick the two or three most important. I mean, what are the ones that really can make a difference for us? And as we summarize these, what we're interested in is where are our strengths, where are our weaknesses, and more so, where do our strengths and our opportunities cross? So where's that sweet spot where those two circles kind of overlap? And what that gives us then is an opportunity, whether it's to reduce labor, to be more digital, to grow sales, to gain accounts. That's an area where we're strong internally and our customers are looking for it. Likewise, if we're looking at something that's significantly different, that it's a weakness we have, in order for us to go there, it's gonna take longer because before we can really capitalize on that opportunity, we have to address that weakness and make it so we're much stronger. Dell, anything to add? No, Larry, I think you covered it pretty nicely uh, for sure. The only thing I would add maybe is that I, I like to use the this particular format um, when I was kind of sitting down with um, you know the key staff that was going to help me carry out the new product launch. Um, it sort of helps you sort of explain, you know, what your thought process is when you're trying to put action plans together, uh, both for the launch, but as well as things you have to fill in around weaknesses and threats. Well, Dell, that's good. That reminds me too is the this can be very helpful and ha was very helpful for me with the dreaded change conversation. Yeah. That as, as technicians and as dental lab, dental lab employees. Most of us are change adverse. That small group that loves it drives the rest of the lab crazy. So it really helped me prepare for 
how do I promote the change? How do I address it? How do I make sure the team's good for it, good with it? And how do we keep it moving forward? Because too often as lab managers or lab owners, we have lots of good ideas and we launch a new one every month and they <laughs> kind of fizzle out and die. And the, uh, that, the, the employee's been with you for 40 years just knows if I keep my head down and I don't make any noise, this will go away and I don't have to worry about it. So with this exercise completed, um, it's important then to say, okay, we've looked at what we're good at. We looked at what our opportunities are. We've looked at what we're not good at. We're looking at changing the, adding this product or adding Trusana in this case. What do I want to accomplish? So if we think about Trusana specifically, what is it that appeals to me? And Dell and I having talked, I mean, having been in labs and having talked with several lab owners, uh, some of the things that come to mind are, you know what, this allows me to convert an existing analog customer or process to a digital customer in a process. And I think often our dentists appreciate us sharing or leading with new technologies that they don't have. Uh, for me, it's an idea, it's an area that I can add new customers. Let's say I'm not in, I'm not really doing the all on four game or, or selling that yet or not doing very many. And this gives me a proven product that I can talk with. I can talk to Dennis about, I've got support and it just helps me with finding more of those digital doctors could be cross-selling existing products. If I pick up a new customer, you know what? Then I got an opportunity to talk to them, whether it's zirconia, whether it's flexible partials, whether night guards, whatever it is, once they're dealing with me, I have the opportunity to sell them more. And then one of the things that I think most of us hope to accomplish with any product or process change is, can we grow our top line and can we grow our bottom line? Dell, anything you can think of? Yeah, I have to say, I was just talking with the laboratory and it's just kind of back to, um, I was asking him why they added uh, Trisana specifically because uh, you know they had added it in. And he was saying he, you know, specifically that it was to leverage skill sets. Um, he felt it was a lot easier to TP teach people to use the software as opposed to actually teach them how to set teeth. Um, so that, you know, that, you know, some of these things that you can have one objective, but they have other, you know, impacts in the laboratory so that, you know, your new product, um, you know, objective, uh, you know, to drive revenues, let's say that, you know, it'll, you can also have like this secondary advantage to doing it. And, and so that I would you know, not hesitate to add that in. So you don't lose you know, sight of that. So with that, now that we know what we're good at, what our opportunities are, we've got some, we've, we've picked the objectives we want to accomplish. What we want to do is we want to set some goals around the product or the process. And depending on depending on your objectives, the process, the, the tangible goals can be set either around customers or sales. It could be set around labor savings, uh, reducing analog processes, whatever those things are, it's important when you start <clears throat> that you give some thought to what success when we come back in 90 days and in six months, how will I determine if I accomplish what we want? And too often as laboratory managers, we don't do this step. And then six months or nine months later, after we've invested dollars and time and all sorts of things, we kind of try to justify what it was that we did. And this is where it's important going in to say, 
you know what, if we're going to spend $100 or $10,000, how do I define that success? And this is set goals. I mean, have a have a 30-day goal, a 90-day goal, and a 180-day goal. And the team that's been involved in bringing the product or process to fruition have that post-mortem meeting. It's kind of, it's something the military has always done. Something that well-run companies do is, you know, we said we wanted to get here, did we? If not, was it poor planning or was it, you know, we just picked the wrong thing to do. And the advantage of that is it really helps you then as you look at the next time you want to make a change like this, you know what, if we didn't get there because we didn't plan it well or we didn't communicate it well, you've got the learning from the last experiment or the last project to make this one better. So if, if the idea is to, I want to shorten turnaround time because I can print teeth right away and I don't have to wait for a special order or deal with back order. What did you do when you started? Were you at four days or six days and did you get to three days or four days? And likewise on analog processes. You know what, did I, what, I've been looking for a denture setup tech for four years or three years now and I can't find one. Is it suddenly because I've digitized the process I don't have that opening anymore. Del, anything you want to add? Uh, no, this that's good, Larry. So um, those are, that's just sample. I mean, those are just, the goals can be anything. And it really is. There are times at Keller, we would make changes just internally to make product flow better. We didn't even tell the customer about it. The customer never knew anything changed but we'd still go through this same process. And then there were times where we would make changes for the customer that had very little impact on manufacturing. It's, it's just what, what's that goal we want to accrue? What's the, what are the objectives? And then let's set some goals around it. Yeah, Larry, let me, before we leave that, I want to score. It's, this is really an important process because if you really sort of like kind of get into it a little bit, it gives you the ability to step back and say, geez, if I'm going to do all that work and the yield is only going to be this, maybe I need to find another place to put my energy. You know what I mean? Sometimes that you overestimate what the impact is going to be until you really put a fine point on it. And, and we can't overemphasize that either, Dell, because uh, we all have limited time Limited, re I, we often think in terms of limited dollars, but I find for most labs, it's really more about limited time and limited manpower. Yeah, absolutely. That it's kind of like, you know, the money's one thing and that's kind of easy to measure because you got to write a check. But what I find is oftentimes we're kind of, we're penny wise on the dollars and pound foolish on the labor and the time. Yeah, and that's a great one. I, it's just it's just something to really think about. The next step is so now we know what we want to do, why we want to do, how it's going to help. It becomes important to what are the things we need to think about, and the four areas that I would focus on, and and you may come up with others, or there may be specific things to deal with, but if we think in terms of customer and marketing that how does it how does it affect our customer and what do we want to accomplish we think of systems and processes so internally what are those things that we need to be aware of so it's do we need new skills do we need to buy new equipment do we what needs to happen within our lab management software to, to get the product created. Who all do we need to communicate with? Exactly. And man, it, oh man, it's new product. You know, so many people are involved in it that are kind of easy to overlook. A uh, classic example is that is that the person on the phone, you know, they, they need to have a script. They know the need to know the features and benefits of that product. I mean, I've overlooked that. I can't tell you too often. And um, it really makes a difference for sure. 
and, and I think that's where to the people in the training side of it is yeah. what training do folks need? What the what what is it with this change? We're generally solving or alleviating one issue, but we have to be careful we don't just move it to a different area. And to Dell's point, and the best advice I can give is communicate, communicate, and communicate because we may think we're repeating ourselves and we're spending too much time on this, but I was always amazed to find after information had been shared five to 10 times with team members, I would still periodically get a team member come to me and say, I don't understand. Yeah, and, I underscore that, Larry. Boy, you talk about frustrating. And, and the best way to get the team on board and moving forward is, We've got to be able to explain why it helps them or why it's better. Right. And the reality is we've also got to deal with, you know what, with, with Trusana, if I move to digital setup and design and print, you know what, I've got to have a conversation with the setter who he's been complaining or she's been complaining about overtime for the last year and a half because we can't find help. But suddenly it's you're trying to take away my job. <laughs> and we got to be able to address that. And we talk about it as kind of like, okay, I mean, sometimes the conversations are hard. I mean, I, I think about, I mean, in the old days, whether we went from building to pressing ceramics, or we went from building crowns to milling zirconia, we had to have those conversations because I didn't want to lose team members because they're just too hard to come by. That it's, I need to encourage them to help learn a new skill. And the reality is job security for any of us in the lab is predicated on our ability to stay with the technology. I mean, it's, we all, a lot, a lot of us like doing gold crowns, but when gold went to whatever it was, $1,800 an ounce and a crown was $300 or $400, we couldn't sell them. So it's what I need. What I needed the team to do was to be open to learning, and really started promoting within Keller lifelong learning. That as we as we evolve, you may well do different things. You're not going to come in and just wax copings all day long. And then the last area to think about is the innovation and development. That it's. How does this help us move our team forward? Does it, how do we use it to, if our desire is to become more digital, how does it help us there? And I think even as important or more important is, what does it set us up for next? Because we see that's the direction that products are going. One thing I'd like to add, Larry, before we leave this is that the, you know, the, the challenge that I've come across in several of the laboratories now is that you have an analog process taking place, you have a digital process taking place, and you have a CAD CAM department. And the coordination between all of those has to be managed. It just doesn't happen. And I, the biggest frustration is kind of communication breakdown between, oh, when, when does this have to be out of my department in a CAD CAM department and over into the, you know, the removal department to, to stay on track, that kind of thing. So, boy, if you've got, you've got a printer out there, you've got to coordinate it so that, you know, you think, you know, uh, pretty thoroughly about how you're going to make that uh, play out so you uh, eliminate as much frustration as possible. I agree with that completely. And, and I think the other thing it does too is oftentimes as we looked at new technologies, maybe we bought that a SEGA printer to do a specific task. We wanted to print surgical guides or, or night guards with it. And you know what? We're only using it two or three hours a day. Yeah, big and one. Suddenly now with this technology, we've got the ability and and let's say whether we're using Exocad or Three Shape, we've got these design stations. You know, they're only getting used a few hours a day. So the nice thing with the digital products is 
a lot of time we have quite a bit of the infrastructure we need to move forward and we can bring in these new technologies that are different but complementary and better utilize that equipment. Yeah. So now we've thought about all these things, we've developed strategies, we've got plans. The final step that is crucial is let's put down our priorities. Let's do that 30, 60, 90 day plan that it takes with these new technologies, this could touch six or eight current employees. It could touch three or four different departments or areas in the lab. So let's make sure we've got a plan to address all of those because what we have all learned the hard way is our progress is limited by our weakest link. And so let's, Let's as much as we can plan for those and what are each step. And regardless of the size of the laboratory, this is really where I like to bring in, rather than all of this being on the owner to do or the manager to do, break it down into little pieces. Let your team help you. And even if you're a four or five person lab, divvy up the responsibilities. One, people like learning new things. I mean, people like doing different things. And yeah, you're probably the best at all of them, but you're the best at so many of the things that make the lab run every day that you can't get them all done. And it's a good chance to see who on your team is ready for more responsibility and who's willing to spend the time to make that progress. Because too often I would be frustrated by employees who said, yeah, I want to learn that, but you got to teach me. And I understood there was some teaching needed to happen, but they didn't want to read anything on their own time. They didn't want to, they just didn't want to put forth any effort where every now and then you get that go-getter that says, hey, can I take that home and read it? Can I take that book home? What's a website I can go look at? Is there a YouTube video? And this is where this 90 day priorities here, when you break them down into 30, 60, 90 days or even shorter, this is your checklist. Do we have everything going on schedule? And the larger the lab, the more complex it becomes. That, you know what, we're all ready to go, but one person or one area didn't get their stuff done. So, you know what, the, uh, the supply person forgot to order all the material we needed. So we only have A1 shade. We don't have anything else. So it's, this is, this is important. Yeah, Larry, one of the things I like to do is once you get this list put together is assign the tasks a week. So week one, you know, the first task get done. You know, the week two, the materials get ordered, that kind of thing, because that, what happens is that if you put it in 90 days, somehow or another, you sort of end up at the end of uh, uh, three months and kind of go, oh, look at all these things that didn't happen. And I think you really need to sort of tick them off week by week. And if it doesn't get happen, is get recommitted to get that to stay on a schedule or, you know, reorganize that process a little bit. But you can't do everything a lot of times in that 90 days. You have to own up to it's going to take a little longer, too. And then once we have that, uh, it seems like Dell and I are harping on it, but share your <laughs> plan. I mean, communicate it. I like just a little simple graphic that I can put up near my bench or near my desk or on the, in the lunchroom that it's, you know what, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, and here's how we're doing it. It's really short, real simple, and it's more design to get your team behind the project and just talking about the project. And I think about several of the labs that have implemented Trusana. You know what? We want to increase sales. We want to increase our production ability. And we want to move to more digital processes. And that may just be your three bullet points. And it's it's kind of fun, it's kind of simple, 
but when you present it then uh, i just at, at keller i'd always I, every now and then i can i either could hear or just imagine somebody muttering in the back of the room as kind of like oh shit here's another one of weiss's crazy ideas and no, nah, we thought about this. We got a team involved and we're working through it. So it's communicate more than you think you need to. And that's really the process. And the whether you're a five person lab or a hundred person lab, the, the steps, the complexity, the detail changes significantly, but the process itself is the same. And by using a process like this, you can engage some other team members who are going to get excited about it. And it's not all on your lap. And my experience is the team just keeps getting better at it. So yeah, maybe the first time you don't get as far or as fast as you want to as quickly. But after you've been doing this for a little while, I found that the... Um, the benefit of 10 hands and five minds was much greater than my two hands and my one mind.